There is a murderer in the room with me. Small, unassuming, you wouldn't know it from the look, but I'm certain that at least 11 lives have been cut short by this killer. For 14 years, I've kept this secret. 14 years, I haven't told a soul. Because I knew that I, if I did, more would die. The Anderson home sat it up a small hill on a one acre lot just outside of the town. While by no means a mansion, it was a well kept respectable residence with a flower garden that won several local awards. As the name suggests, in the mid 80s, it was inhabited by the Anderson family. Father, Tim, worked in sales and in had inherited the house from his parents. Mother, Dennis, worked in real estate. And daughters Kate and Julia, aged 17 and 15 respectively, attended the public high school. Julia was athletic and tall amongst her peers. Playing several sports, including soccer and softball, she had a large group of friends and was considered quite popular in her class. Tim coached some of her teams, and Denise was always to be found in the stands, loudly cheering. Kate was precisely the opposite of her sister. She never once set foot on a basketball court or attempted running track. Instead, she dressed in mostly black and snuck cigarettes behind the gymnasium at recess. Still, though she was not as widely well-liked as Julia, she did have a small, close-knit group of friends that bonded over one thing in particular, studying the occult. Tim and Denise were fairly active in their church, and it said, were none too pleased with their older daughter's interest in unholy topics. They dragged her to service every Sunday and forced her into Bible study. But it seemed to have the opposite effect they intended. Kate only became more fascinated with the other side of the coin. Kate and her friends studied Latin and were frequently known to speak to each other in it. They passed notes in class that only they could translate and hissed insults at other students that only they understood. After complaints from several parents that the children were worried that the satanic kids were putting spells on them, the school warned Kate and company that they'd be suspended if they continued with their demonic nonsense. But the warning wasn't enough. During a free period, a janitor caught them conducting a ritual in a dark, empty classroom, complete with candles and a pentagram drawn on the blackboard. And they were all suspended for a week. That was a last straw for the Anderson parents. They put Kate on lockdown. She was grounded indefinitely and was to have no contact with her friends, only being allowed to leave her room to use the restroom on or for meals with the family. And then, on the second day of the suspension, Tim and Denise awoke to a nightmare. Kate hung herself. She was found dangling in her closet when her mother entered to rouse her for her breakfast. A noose made from a rope that no one recognized wrapped around her neck. The Anderson were crushed. Yes, she had been a problematic child, but they'd still love her deeply. Tim and Denise had been hoping that the suspension would be good for her, that some time away from her friends would maybe help her turn around. Now she was gone, and they didn't understand why. She left no note or explanation. She hadn't been known to be depressed, and when questioned, her friends all said that she never talked of hurting herself. They were all as shocked as her parents were, and were just as devastated by her loss. Worst impacted, though, was Julia. While it may have been obvious to an outside observer, Julia had been very close to, with her sister, and she looked up to her in many ways. Julia admired that Kate didn't care what anyone else thought of her, and that she was truly comfortable with who she was, something that Julia often struggled with. In the days immediately afterwards, Julia sobbed nearly constantly. Everyone did what they could to console her, yet it was largely to no avail. And they mostly thought it best to just let her grieve, knowing that the passage of time would be the only thing that could start the healing. However, at some point shortly after Kate's death, Julia's behavior changed. She still sobbed. That part remained the same, but it's sad that it wasn't sadness they saw on her face anymore. It was fear. Julia became paranoid. Her eyes darted wildly around any room that she was in, and she jumped whenever anyone spoke to her. Friends tried to ask her what she was so afraid of, 
but she refused to tell them, stating only that they should leave her alone. Worried, they wondered if she might be in some sort of danger, if maybe there was more to Kate's suicide than the Andersons were saying, and those fears were seemingly confirmed when the unthinkable happened. Julia was found hanging in her bedroom too. Where the rest of the town had been initially nothing but supporting of Tim and Denise, now they were suspicious. Kate's death had been a tragedy, no doubt, but she had also been somewhat of a pariah. It wasn't surprising to many that the girl dressed in black and hung out with the creepy crowd had been troubled enough to tie her own noose. But Julia? Julia had been so full of life, so energetic, such a beacon of positivity to her teammates and peers, no one believed that she would have done to that to herself. So an investigation into the girl's untimely demises were conducted. Forensics were investigated. Tim and Denise were both questioned at length. But there were no evidence that they'd done anything wrong. And neither of them confessed or to any wrongdoing. In fact, neither of them spoke much at all after Julia's passing. Or ever went back to church. Or ever went back to work. With nothing to say otherwise, Kate and Julia's deaths were both officially ruled as suicides. And then the Andersons were left to return to their home, to their empty nest, one that had once held so much promise. It was thought it was only a matter of time before one or both of them might be found dangling from a rope themselves, but instead, a month or so after Julia died, a moving truck showed up at the Anderson home. Neighbors saw boxes quickly being loaded, and then without a word to anyone in the town, they just drove away, leaving many of the larger items behind. The house was already paid off and was never put up on the market. But someone continued to pay the property taxes every year, so the locals wondered if one day Tim and Dennis might move back in. But they never did. Their home remained vacant from then on. Often, it was pondered why they didn't sell it. But the assumption was that even though they couldn't bear to ever return, they also couldn't bear to lose the place where the daughters had lived their entire short lives. So, year after year, it loomed over the residence below, slowly being reclaimed by nature, a decaying reminder of the two young women taken far too early. That's at least how the events were relayed as a local legend. By the time I was born, the house had already sat empty for five years. The once award-winning flower garden was overgrown with weeds, the paint was flecked and peeling, and many of the windows were shattered. I obviously never knew any of the Andersons personally, but I knew their stories by heart before I was in the fourth grade. Every kid in the Willow Grove heard it eventually, either from an older sibling or a friend who'd heard it from another older sibling, or from a friend of a friend who'd heard it from an older sibling. It passed by oral tradition from one generation to the next. There were verifiable facts contained within the home in, that indeed belonged to Tim and Dennis Anderson. Both of their names were on the t title, and the Anderson girls had definitely attended Willow Grove High School. A trophy bearing Julia's name sat in a case near the gym, and Kate could be found in old yearbooks. Kate and Julia had also most certainly died of hanging within the days of one another. Newspapers covered the story at the time were archived in the library. As for the details of the behavior, those came from the classmates of the girls and church members that knew Tim and Dennis. It was a main topic of gossip among the townspeople for many, many years, as nothing else note ever really happened in Willow Grove, until 14 years ago. Given the fact that two unbelievably tragic deaths occurred within its walls, the Anderson home was perverted to be deeply haunted. Throughout my childhood, I heard many different versions of way one could have encountered there. If you look into the metal window on the second floor during a thunderstorm, you will see a girl hanging when there's a flash of lightning. If you sneak into the house after midnight, you can hear Julia crying in her room. And if you're in Kate's bedroom at 3 a.m., the time when they suspect she hung herself, You'll feel as if someone is tightening around your neck and you'll struggle to breathe. In time, it became a rite of passage for every teen in town to spend a few hours after dark in the house at some point during their high school career. They always returned with thrilling tales of having been chased through the hallways by angry spirits or being hauled up by air 
into their throats. Most of it was surely pure fabrication, but still, to the students of WHS, having done your hanging night was considered just as important as qualification for graduation as passing all your final exams. So it was on the evening of February 10, 2010, I entered the Anderson home with two of my best friends, Freddie and James. James Wheeler and I have been inseparable since kindergarten, a pairing based on nothing more than both thinking that Velociraptors was the coolest dinosaur. It was enough to bond us for life. He was a skinny boy of 18, with dark brown hair and matching eyes, taller than me, but shorter than Freddie. Freddie King had joined our party of two during our freshman year at WGHS. He transferred in from another school when his dad moved into town for some consulting work and quickly inserted himself into our lives. Far more outgoing than either James or I, he had boisterously introduced himself by saying that he'd heard that you two like video games and then said, we're going to be friends. 18 years old in 2010 as well. He had to build to play football but never went out for the team. Instead, most nights, the three of us all felt a certain call to duty and spent our hours dominating our enemies together online. And unlike James or I, Freddy was also what one would have considered classically good-looking. His blonde hair and blue eyes attracted the attention of several girls in our class, and his perfect teeth had never needed braces. Because of this, Freddy had to occasionally miss her evening gaming sessions when he was out on a date. And after one such night, he caught up with us the next day at school looking exasperated. Guys, you know how I've been seeing Heather, right? He asked. I sparked. Of course we knew about him and Heather. Half the school was talking about how the head cheerleader was dating the hard nerd. Was dating that hot nerd. Yeah, dude, we're part of everybody. So we made that very exclusive list of people who know. James snarked at him. I laughed. And Freddie looked at a little embarrassed when she, when he replied, Shut up, assholes. Look, I need to talk to you guys about something. His expression was very serious. I couldn't help but give a sarcastic response. She gave you herpes? No. He tried to look angry, but I could see that smile on his face as he threw a light jab at my shoulder. All right, all right. What's up with you and Heather? James defused the situation. Okay, so last night we were hanging out at her place and she wanted to watch a scary movie. I guess she likes horror. So she asked which was my favorite and I told her that I didn't have one because I don't really believe in ghosts or anything and prefer comedies. Well, she was a little put off by that. James and I both rolled our eyes at how stupid he'd been. Yeah, yeah, I know I fucked up. I should have just said I loved horror and named like literally any movie I know in the judge genre. But anyway... She asked I if I really didn't believe or if I was just a big scaredy cat because she can't be dating a pussy. And I told her that I wasn't scared of that stuff. I just never had any paranormal experiences and didn't, didn't think monsters were real. I cut him off. Dude, you gonna get to that point anytime soon? We'll be in college before you finish this story. Okay, fine, fine. Long story short. She wants me to do the hanging night to prove that I'm not a little bitch. For someone that claimed to not believe in ghosts, I couldn't help but notice the touch of anxiety in his eyes as he said it. Seriously? James chortled. I thought we agreed a long time ago that that was a dumb tradition. Yeah, man. I had it. Plus, I mean, yeah, I know, like, everyone does it, but two girls died there, it's super fucking sad. I always thought the whole thing was kinda, I don't know, spectful? I guess, Freddy sighed. Okay, valid points, and agreed it's stupid, but have you seen Heather? She told me that if I do it and, br and bring back some proof, I'll be rewarded. His expression went vacant, no doubt envisioning Heather's prize for his bravery. Dude, come on, there's gotta be easier ways for you to get laid. I was beginning to understand that Freddy was not asking for opinion, he had already made up his mind. And James appeared to have made the same connection as he said next. You're doing this with or without us, aren't you? Freddy gave us the same look that he had when he told us that he was going to be our friends for years in the earlier. No, I'm not going to do it without you because you're both coming and you know what I'd do for either of you. Neither James or I could argue with this point. 
If either of us had the slightest chance with a girl, Freddy would have done anything to make it happen for us. So, when are we doing this? James asked. Tonight. On the... On the night of 10th, Freddy told his parents that he was going to James' house to study. And James told his that he was going to mine, and I told mine that I was going to Freddy's. All of us said that we'd be back to our homes by 10 p.m., as it was a school night, and then set off to Anderson's around 7. It had rained earlier, and the sky remained overcast. As the sun had set shortly after 6, we knew we would be soon in total darkness and used flashlights that Freddy had snuck in from his garbage, from his garage, to guide our way. There was a well-worn path through the woods to the backyard of the Anderson home. Over 20 years worth of miscreants looking for a thrill had been beaten, had beaten a trail through the bush, and it continued through the overgrown yard leading directly to the back door. For a time, the police had kept an eye on the place and arrested trespassers, but there were just too many to corral. They would have needed to hire an officer full time to watch the house at night. And there simply wasn't funding for it. And with the indication that the Andersons would ever return, nor seeming to care for any of the possessions they had left behind, eventually the entire town made a silent agreement to let the local teens go on the little ghost hunts without impediments. As we approached the home, we listened to see if any of the others had decided that tonight would be their hanging night as well, but heard no sounds coming through the broken windows, so we continued on. We knew from the other stories that the back doors was always unlocked and Freddy, being in the lead, was not one to open and enter first. James and I followed cautiously behind him to see that it was pitch black within, our flashlights the only source of illumination. The door opened into a mudroom, where the coat hangers lay scattered across the floor, and a thick layer of dust had settled over the old washer and dryer. Scuff marks on the floor indicated that this area was well trafficked, but this lessened where the tile transitioned to the hardwood of the hallway ahead, and I wondered if this was as far as many people made it into the home who were afraid to continue deeper. Freddy was, however, determined that he'd prove his manhood to Heather by going for the full experience, which meant that we were going to need to spend at least two full hours in the house, and that we'd need to enter both Julia and Kate's rooms. So we navigated further inside, stepping into the hallway that branched off into the kitchen, dining room, and living room. Shining my light along the walls as I went, I noticed the initials and dates had been etched into them. It seemed many that had passed the bedroom wanted to leave a mark proving that they'd done so. Now at this point, I'll mention that I was terrified the minute we walked through the door. I would never have admitted it to either of them, but I was most definitely believed in ghosts that time. And I most definitely felt uncomfortable invading somewhere that had played host to such horrific events. The only things that kept me moving forward were the fact that I was with my two best friends, who even if they were scared themselves, were both doing their best impression of nonchalance, and that hundreds of others had done the same thing, and no one had died in the house since Julia. As I was considering this, and listening intently for the slightest sound other than our careful footsteps, Freddy's voice made me jump. Think we should carve our names in the wall? He whispered. No. I don't want a record that we were in here in case Anderson's ever come back. The reason I gave aloud was different than the reason in my head. I really didn't want to potentially upset Julia and Kate by defiling their house. Yeah, good point. Well, might as well take a look around if we're gonna be here for a while, he spoke uneasily. And I was somewhat relieved to hear a hint of wavering in his words. At least I knew I wasn't the only one that was feeling anxious. James and I started in the kitchen while Freddy made his way through the living and dining rooms. But there wasn't really much to see. All of the kitchen drawers and cabinets had been emptied, and the only items remaining in the living and dining rooms were a few large, grimy pieces of furniture. There were lighter spots on the tattered well paper, and where it was obvious that the family photos or artwork had one sung, that the curtains one on the windows were moth-bitten. It was deeply unsettling. The abandonment struck a nerve somewhere inside me. 
and a knot twisted in my stomach. Think we should head upstairs? Freddy asked, as we regrouped at the base of the steps. You first, I nudged him. I heard him take a sharp inhale as if stealing himself before he slowly crept his way up to the second floor. James threw me an insecure glance, but then nodded, and we went next. My ears had never been so primed for sound. Pausing for a moment after making the scent, I realized that outside of James and Freddy's footfalls, I heard nothing. No ambient noise, no cars, no crickets, no bats. I never understood before the moment how loud silence can be. I became acutely aware of the rapidity of my heartbeat by the pulses reverberating in my eardrums. Guys, check this out. Freddy's light shone from the inside of the first door, on the right of the upper hallway, and James and I went through to meet him. Based on the local lore, we had undoubtedly entered Kate's bedroom. The walls were painted black, and on them, several pentagrams had been sprayed, painted, or etched in. There were other odd symbols here and there as well, that I didn't recognize, but I got the feeling that Kate hadn't likely done any of it herself. As with the lower floor, the furniture had been left behind, but everything else had been removed. There was nothing on the desk or on the bedside tables. Nothing inside the dresser drawers. The entire space gave an air of emptiness. I didn't like being inside the room. The silence was even more complete than it had been in the hallway. Even our movements felt muffled, and I couldn't shake the feeling that someone was watching us. Someone just out of view. Someone that always managed to duck out of my flashlight but beam whenever he moved it. Then behind me, I heard the... I heard what sounded like a sliding door opening and suddenly... Fuck! Freddy yelled. And I felt his weight shake the floor. I whipped around and shined my light to see that he was on his back having tripped over his own feet and which he'd stumbled away from the closet he'd just opened. I saw what made him jump. Hanging from the clothes rack inside the closet was a noose. My stomach dropped at once. Were we about to see the phantom of Kate? I wondered. But then James walked forward boldly and touched it. Nothing happened. It's a prank, he reasoned. Just a prank. I bet some asshole hung this up in here. You scared the shit out of the people. I let out the breath I'd been holding and heard Freddy do the same. He slowly got back to his feet and picked up his flashlight. Let's get out of here, he said. I could see that he was now thoroughly shaken. Like leave the house? I asked hopefully. No, just out of this room. I don't like it in here. He walked back out of the hallway and I heard him traipsing in the opposite direction from the stairs. James and I hung back, still trying to calm down, and I checked my phone. It was nearly 8 p.m. We hadn't even been inside for 30 minutes yet. It'll be over soon, I told myself. Nothing's really happened yet, it's just a house. I had just managed to decrease my heart rate slightly when, from the f direction Freddy had gone, I heard a loud thud, and something dropped to the bit. Something dropped to the ground. Freddy yelped in pain. Ah, son of a bitch. James and I both turned it from the Kate's room and saw light coming from the one next to it. We found Freddy inside rubbing the ankle he'd clearly just whacked against a small table he hadn't noticed. He dropped his flashlight when he'd done so, and it would roll under the bed. While Freddy continued to spout expletives, I quickly scanned the room and realized that it was likely Julia's. The walls were painted what had once been a very vibrant pink, but it had a different quality to it rather than the rest of the house. Quality of youth and life. I couldn't explain it, but it made it all the more eerie. Fuck, that hurt. Grab my light, would ya? Freddy indicated to me as I was in the closet. As I was the closest, and I leaned my head down under the bed frame to retrieve him. And then I saw something odd. The front of the flashlight was sagging into the floor. The weight of it had dropped one end of a floorboard down ever so slightly and picked up the other side. Curiosity got better off me and I slipped a couple of fingers under the raised edge of the board to find that it was loose. I pulled up
I pulled it up to reveal a small cavity that looked like it was hiding several items. Guys, I think I might have found something, I told others. Reaching into the opening, I pulled out a very sm very old pack of cigarettes. Maybe Julia had her rebellious side as well. A box of matches and last a small, very old and very weathered book. The cigarettes and the matches made sense and seemed normal enough for a young teenager to hide beneath the floorboard. But the book? That was something strange about the book. The instant I touched it, I felt nauseated and my natural instinct was to throw it away as far as I could. I passed the items back to James and Freddy as I removed them from the hole. Feeling better, the instant Freddy took the book from me. The fuck is this? Freddy considered its black leather cover as I handed it to him, his flashlight to inspect it closer. He flipped it to open the first page and found sandwiched inside a folded sheet of notebook paper. Placing the book down on the bedside table, he unfolded the sheet and read the first line. Holy shit. I heard his breaths coming down more quickly. Well? I inquired. What does it say? Freddy recited it aloud to us. Mom and Dad, don't read this journal. You will die. Kate showed to me the day before. The day before they caught her and her friends performing that ritual. She'd bought it at a pawn shop because the owner said it was cursed and she was planning to show it to her friends, but I guess she never got the chance before she was suspended. I found it in a hidden beneath some clothes in her dresser the day after she died. I'm sorry I never told you. I was looking for answers. I wanted an explanation. Well, I found one. I read this thinking that maybe she should used to write her final note, but I was wrong. She hadn't written it, but someone else had. Someone else had a very long time ago. And I think he killed her. It's too late for me. I've been hearing things at night. He's getting closer. I've tried to get rid of it several times already. Tried burning it, burying it, throwing it outside the bus window, but it just keeps coming back. I don't think I can stop him. I'm so sorry that I didn't tell you, but I was afraid that if I did, you'd read it just to try and prove me wrong. I'm hiding this in hopes that you never find it, but if you should, please, please just believe me and never read this journal. I don't want him to take you too. We didn't kill ourselves, he did. I love you, and Kate loved you too, Julia. Fuck me. I needed to wipe a tear from my eye as Freddy finished. You think this is real? James asked, he looked skeptical. Freddy picked the book back up from the bedside table and studied it more closely. Nah, no way. People have been coming here over 20 years. You really think no one's ever found that hiding spot before? No, I bet you those same fuckers that hung the news over in Kate's room left this, here, left this in here to mess with the people. Come on, a cursed journal? He was chuckling slightly as he finished, working his hardest to convince himself. Here. He opened the back to the first page and read off. Property of Archibald Wiggins. Archibald Wiggins? James burst out laughing. Yeah, I think I'm with you. No way that's real name. Jesus. They had me going for there for a minute with that note. However, I didn't share either of the conviction that it was all just a joke. I don't know guys, that spa was pretty well hidden. I kinda felt something when I touched that thing. Like kinda sick. Freddy cracked up again. Dude, it's a book. You're really scared of it? He thumbed through the pages. Whoever wrote this just wanted to be a wannabe horror writer. It's nothing but a bunch of graphic descriptions of martyrs from 1870s and holy crap, listen to this on the last page. I, Archibald Wiggins, am the devil's servant. The law is closing in. They found the bodies. What sorrow that my wicked life be cut short before I could take more with me. Unfortunately... I shall be swinging at the end of a noose before the week is out, but my work will carry on. Seven have already met their fate at my hands, and true, I will soon be removed from me from my earthly body. I will never stop, for upon these words I place a curse. Whomever shall read them will share my fate. Finia Matti. Bullshit. James grabbed the journal from Freddy's hands and he read and read the page himself. 
His face broke into an incredulous smirk as he finished it. Ooh, real scary, he choked. The hell is Venium at tea? That Latin? He tried to check, hand the journal to me. Eric, check this out. But I refused. I didn't care that they were going to make fun of me, but there was something wrong with it. Something malignant. I didn't want to touch it ever again. Keep that thing away from me, I said forcefully. Alright, dude, whatever. James tried to laugh off my cowardice, but I caught the slightest hint of apprehension on his face as he handed it back to Freddy. I wondered if he felt the same sort of darkness that I had felt when I was holding the journal. I was now somewhat regretting his choice to read it. I gotta show this to Heather. I was just gonna have one of you take a picture of me here in as a proof, but this is way better. Come on, I won't make you guys stay the full two hours now that we've got this. We're not gonna see ghosts anyways, unless Archibald shows up. Freddy made fake ghost noises taunting me. While he folded up Julia's note and stuck it back inside the journal. He and James started towards the door, cackling about Archibald coming to get us, when suddenly they both froze. Did you hear that? James was on high alert. Hear what? I replied. There was still oppressively quiet around me. The whistling? Said Freddy. Alright, I get it guys. I'm a bitch for not reading the journal. How long are you gonna mess with me? My hair stood in the end. I was willing to believe that they were just screwing around. But I had no idea how they had coordinated it so quickly and perfectly without me seeing. Shh. James implored. We all stood dead still for a minute before Freddy said, Must have been a bird up in the attic or something. But he didn't really sound that convinced. James agreed with him. Yeah, yeah, probably. Let's get out of here though. We quickly made our way back downstairs and out through the mudroom. Once I was back in the cold night air, the knot that had twisted itself tighter in my stomach, each minute that would remain inside began to loosen. I started to feel a little silly about having been so terrified of a book that James and Freddy's points had likely just been planted to scare people. But all the same, I had no intention of ever reading it. Parted ways after exiting the woods, and went back to our respective homes, all proud of ourselves for having survived the hanging night, and with Freddy excited to see Heather the following day. But the next day at school, neither Freddy or James looked as triumphant as the night before. Both had large bags under their eyes, and were slightly twitchy. They were talking to each other in low whispers by Freddy's locker when I approached. Jesus, you guys look like shit. You stay up all night gaming again? I tried to remain optimistic, but my heart sunk the minute I saw them. Something was wrong. And I already knew that it had nothing to do with video games. No, um, did you, did you hear anything last night after you got home? James was shuddering. His expression ran ice through my veins. Nothing out of the ordinary. I fell asleep pretty much right when I got back. I was out until my alarms went off this morning. You okay? I wanted to be comforting. But the knot in my stomach had returned. Freddy's eyes darted back, boards from one end of the hallway to the other. He was expecting something out of place to appear at any moment. James began again. I just didn't get much sleep. Every time that I was about to doze off, there was this, this whistling. It's a song, but I don't recognize it. I swear it was exactly what I heard when we were leaving Anderson's. Freddy slowly nodded. It was clear that he'd have the same night that James had. We shouldn't have read that journal, he said in a low shaking voice, leaning back against his locker to support himself. All the while, his eyes kept shifting up and down the corridor. I waited for them to crack a smile, for Freddy to punch my shoulder like he always did when we were joking around, but their faces remained unchanged. Guys. Look, I know I wouldn't read it last night, but I don't know. I'm sure it's not actually cursed. We probably both just got really worked up by that note. And you both said yourselves that it was likely a prank. What you're hearing is probably in your heads. My mouth formed the words, but my brain didn't fully trust them. Nothing in the note or the journal had said anything about whistling. James and Freddy never locked on that night for our usual evening gaming session and were worse at the school the following day. Again, neither of them got any sleep. Again, they'd heard the whistling, but they'd 
looked more terrified than before. Freddy could barely talk, and James couldn't stop fidgeting. He's getting closer, James explained. I didn't just hear him last night, I saw him. There was a pr presence in my room, darkness behind me. I rolled over to check, and at first I didn't notice anything out of the ordinary, but then a shadow shifted in a corner. It looked like, oh Jesus. He trailed off. Do you know what Inyamat team means? He asked. No, the first time I heard it was the other night. Couldn't even feign that they were experiencing might not be real anymore. They were both so genuinely frightened. I looked it up. It's something like, I will come to you. James paused. Eric, I think we fucked up. I don't think Julius note was fake. I, I think he's coming for us. Tears are welling in his eyes. Freddy had begun hyperventilating while James was talking. I turned to him and asked, Do you still have the journal? He gave a sideways glance at his backpack on, on the floor. You have it here with you? I was shocked that he was carrying the source of his torment around with him. He blurted out a pained whisper, Well, I can't leave it at home. What if one of my parents reads it? Or my little brother? You don't understand. He's not coming for you. I even broke up with Heather because I don't want her with ten feet with this thing. Thank God I didn't go see her on my way home from the Andersons. He put his face down into his hands. Okay, well, we'll get rid of it or destroy it, burn it or something. Even as I said it, I remember Julia's words. Don't you think I've tried? You heard what Julia wrote too. Yet, I tried anyway, but she was right. Burning it, tearing it up, throwing it in the lake, burying it, it always comes back. Now I understand why Freddy's eyes were constantly searching. James was looking defeated, but I wasn't ready to give up. Maybe we can take it to Father Mackey? Maybe he can do a ceremony on it or something? Break the attachment that it has to Archibald? He knows our families. What if he doesn't believe us? What if he tells our parents that they take the journal and read it? James was right. All of our families attended the same church. And I don't know how much time we have either. He was so close last night. My mind was reeling, trying to think of something that we could do. Fuck. Okay, okay. Tonight? Tonight you guys can stay at my house. My parents are going to play in the city. And won't be back until morning. I'll look up some stuff on how to cleanse cursed objects. And we'll deal with this thing ourselves. We'll camp out in the backyard like we used to. There's no trees, and it's a couple hundred yards from the woods. Nothing to hang from. I'll stay up all night with you guys, and we'll get rid of him somehow. We were foolish boys. That night, I pitched a tent in the backyard and printed off every invocation, chant, ceremony, or ritual that I could find that said it could help us destroy the journal. Many of them involved holy water, Bibles, rosaries, and various holy objects. Luckily, between the three of us, we were able to gather up all the materials we'd need to conduct the blessings by taking items our religious parents had stored around our houses. James and Freddy arrived around 6 p.m., and as we were making our way to backyard, James pulled me aside, telling Freddy to continue to the tent and starting to set up. Look, I appreciate what you're trying to do, but I'm not sure this is going to work. I tried to reassure him. James, it's going to. But he cut me off. Just listen to me for a minute. We can feel him, and he's near. We can't explain it. We know that he'll reach us tonight. If this doesn't work, and it comes for us, you can never tell our families the truth. Do you understand? Freddy and I have agreed, and have written notes explaining that we've been depressed for a long time and plan to do it together. That you had no idea. He stopped for a moment, and I could tell his the speech was rehearsed that he was doing his best to hold hold it together. He was convulsing, collecting himself, he continued. We can't risk anyone ever reading in that thing again. If we die, we will have to hold on to it, keep it away from everyone, forever. Please, Eric, swear that you'll do this. James, I swear. Okay, okay, I swear. Thank you. He looked the slightest bit relieved. We made our way outside to join Freddy. Inside the tent, by candlelight, we began shortly after dark, throwing everything we had at it, 
dousing it in holy water, holding rosaries, chanting Bible verses. James and Freddy were desperate in their fervent attempts to kill the thing that had been stalking them for days, and for a time, we thought it might be working. Neither of them heard the whistling, and the presence that feel seemed to moving further away. I even saw Freddy crack a smile for the last time, for the first time in two days. But then, some time after midnight, they both froze again, just like they had on our hanging night. No, Freddy whimpered. Both of their heads swung around and fixated on the wall of the back of the tent. Then they followed something moving around as towards the entrance. Oh God, no! My heart was in my throat. I wanted to reach out and hold on to them, but I was suddenly overcome with exhaustion. Blackness pressed in on my vision, and I collapsed to the ground. The last thing I he heard was the zipper opening and the screams of my best friends before I passed out. The tent was empty when I awoke. In the dawn, sunlight on the thirteenth. But I didn't need to go far to find out my missing friends. When I poked out my head outside, I saw James and Freddy swinging in the early morning breeze. Two trees side by side, right at the edge of the woods that we thought were too far away. I kept my promise to James and never told his or Freddy's family the truth. The notes they had written were convincing, and both their deaths were designated as suicides. And two. I have held on to the journal ever since. It sits in a locked in a it sits in a locked in a safe in my bedroom. While I've never read it, Archibald's curse has been burned in my memory ever since that night at the Anderson house. Over the years, I've considered different ways to getting rid of it, but all of them come with an inherent risk of someone reading it. If it was unsuccessful, and I don't want to give Archibald satisfaction of taking another life, for a while I tried to research him. To see maybe if I could find his remains and destroy those, wondering if that maybe break his curse. But I can't find anything about a murderous Archibald Wiggins from the 1870s. They didn't keep the best records back then. So the simplest solution I thought was that the journal would just stay with me. I wrapped it in the plastic a long time ago because I have a theory that it stays with whoever touched the cover last. It's why it's never left me. And White never left the Anderson home until Freddy took it. My will stipulates that I be buried with it. I'd hoped that would be enough to put an end to it all, but I think he's getting annoyed with having been hidden for so long, contained by a life that he can't take. He might need to try something different soon, because recently at night, I swear I've heard a muted whistling.